Assalamualaikum and uh, a very good morning to all audience uh, listening here, uh, listening in today. Uh, my name is Safwan. I'm so glad to have you uh, join us uh, in this in this session. So this is going to be another, uh, continue to be another exciting session, uh, a long line of of uh, other exciting uh, panel that has happened yesterday as well as today. So today the topic will be catalyzing agri. Iskandar, uh, investment Berhad, uh, the drone and uh, drone and uh, robotics uh, zone, as well as of course you know uh, Grace Farhan for 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 inviting me in. So um, I am just going to help set the context yeah uh, for for the setting for our discussion here today, and uh, hopefully um, the audience will be able to. Uh, grasp a, a lot better because we may have audience from different segment and different level of maturity when we're discussing about agriculture and we're discussing about drone tech. So hopefully this will bring everybody to a common platform so that we can have uh, an engaging and a good discussion as well. Yeah. So I've did a bit of, of, of studying and uh, this is something that I would like to share with uh, the audience here today and perhaps the um, the panelists that I will shall introduce after this can also uh, be touching on this on these topics. Uh, so the the United Nations projected that the world's population will reach a massive 9.7 billion people by 2050. Yeah. So causing and this will cause an agriculture uh, consumption to raise by 69% between 2010 and 2050. So that's facts, so that's one, yeah? So just as a comparison, in case you, you're curious to know how much will Malaysia grow, well, I did also a check and I found that on Dawson website, our population by 2040 will grow to about 41.5 million, yep? And also I just would like to share another example, uh, another study done by Markets and Markets that, that highlighted that the agriculture drone market is expected to grow from a USD 1.2 billion in 2020 to USD 5.7 billion by 2025, yeah, which is just four years away, and at a CAGR of 35.9 percent, yeah. And the and the good news that I want to share and is relevant for here us here in this region is that APEC is leading the charge, yeah. And uh, the main application that we've seen and uh, reported by markets and markets is in the area of precision agriculture, livestock monitoring, and precision fish farming. You know, you can look up markets and market study. Yeah. So, and I would also like to bring up point number three, which is uh, our agriculture contribution, Malaysia's agriculture contribution to a GDP uh, based on the Dawson figures in 2019 is about 7.1%. Uh, equivalent to 101.5 billion yeah and um, i'm quite sure that you know you may you may in case you are asking the next question is who's the big biggest contributor what segment is the biggest contributor for most we will know number one from agriculture will be all pop yeah uh, at 37.7 and then uh, other agricultures perhaps uh, uh, including rice but uh, paddy plantation 25.9 livestock, fishing, forestry, logging, and rubber, yeah? And also, I would like to bring the fourth uh, um, in interesting fact is that, you know, we've been locked down for many, many, many months, yeah? And because of COVID. So let's, I want to also later on discuss with the panel about COVID, yeah? Because OECD mentioned that, you know, the farm production generally, yeah, uh, uh, there's a bottleneck because of labor availability, yeah? Some... Uh, farm sectors are more dependent on labors than others, yeah, uh, and uh, limited limits on the mobility of people. We can't move around as 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 you know how we want as before because of MCO, and specifically MPOC mentioned that you know uh, uh, thirty percent of the plantation workforce are Malaysian, so which means seventy percent are not Malaysian, and the travel restriction does have impact in terms of foreign labor as well, labor shortages as well. 
In fact, in May 2020, it was reported that uh, for palm oil, including palm other plantation industries, the, they, there was a shortage of 500,000 workers. Yeah, and this actually impact adversely yeah the our uh, our oil palm production. And I think there's a lot of other interesting facts. In case you are not into palm oil, in case you are into paddy as well, you know you. I would invite all the audience here to look up uh, Kazana Research Institute 2019 study on, on paddy in terms of whether or not Malaysia has you know, enough self-sufficiency for rice, which is what most Malaysians eat, morning, afternoon, and night, and sometimes for supper as well. Yeah? So our rice import in 2018 is about 1.1 billion for 740 uh, kilogram tons of rice. So, but at the same time, when I, when I did the, a bit more uh, of, of studying, I, I, I see that, you know, that the, um, our land used for, for paddy uh, plantation has gone down or has staggered or, or has plateaued. At the same time, the advancement in fourth IR deployment isn't really that great. Yeah, so this is something that I want to bring up to the panel. And uh, if you look in terms of the youth are not there, they don't find working in, in plantation to be fun. Um, uh, it is not, it's, it's hot, yeah, it's hot, it's dirty, it's dangerous. So what would the youth want to be in the field as they can be behind a laptop safely, you know, in an air-conditioned room, yeah? But again, taking into consideration all the facts and figures that I have mentioned, yeah, you have 9.7 billion mouths to feed by 2050 and 40 over, mil, uh, 40 over million by 2040 are Malaysian mouth. Yeah, Do we have enough rice? So you connect all the dots. So now without further ado, what I would like to do now, these are all very distinguished speaker. Yeah, It will be unfair for me. Uh, it will not be, a, I mean, do not doing them justice for me to introduce because I think they, they can do the pitch themselves you know, superbly well, yeah? So I'm going to introduce you guys. We got three, uh, sorry, I showed four, but we have three, yeah? Got three on the panel today. We got uh, Jin Zi Jiang, Jiang uh, uh, or JX, uh, um, properly known uh, from Polar Drone. We got uh, Wilson from Avatech, yeah? And we got one Azrain Adnan from Mata Aerotech, yeah? So what I would like to do in the next uh, five to 10 minutes is to invite our panelists each of them will give about three minutes of a pitch so that they can they can share with you personally in terms of what is it that they do yeah what what big national regional global problems that they want to solve yeah with regards to agriculture so uh, i don't have it by queue yeah i can choose it by queue but um, i'm opening up first ones to go okay i'll choose by alphabetical order I chose Matara Tech. What is Rain? You are muted. All right. Uh, th thank you, Shafwan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Azrin uh, from uh, Matara Tech. Uh, first and foremost, uh, of course, it is a pleasure to be here today, uh, part of the conference. Uh, and also, uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be on this panel with my esteemed colleagues, uh, JX and also Wilson. Um, uh, and uh, also, uh, congratulations uh, to Iskandar for organizing this uh, conference uh, and bringing together the parties involved uh, in the drone and robotics uh, ecosystem uh, uh, under one uh, conference. A very, very good effort for us to actually move forward uh, the industry. So, uh, I, I'm uh, from uh, Mata Aerotech. The, the name Mata Aerotech itself uh, actually uh, summarizes uh, who we are. Uh, Mata is actually short form of Malaysia, Ma and Ta, uh, Taiwan, because uh, Mata Aerotech is actually a joint venture company uh, between uh, Malaysia and uh, Taiwan organizations. So that's where we get uh, we got the name uh, Mata, uh, whereby the, the 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 name Aerotech itself uh, actually signifies our core disciplines, which are aerospace and also uh, robotics uh, technology. So uh, we as as a group. Uh, we actually uh, identify ourselves as a full service organization, uh, meaning we do from A to Z uh, in the drone uh, uh, industry. Uh, we do a lot of uh, research and development. Uh, we do simulation. 
Uh, we even do uh, manufacturing and assembly of drones. Uh, we manufacture our own drones. Uh, we do pilot training. Uh, we do offer drone commercial services. Uh, and also we do uh, offer data analytics uh, services. So uh, in short, in terms of the supply chain, uh, we, we, we consider ourselves as a full, a full service uh, organization. So uh, as I mentioned just now, uh, we produce our own drone. Uh, so we have a range of uh, drones that we actually produce. Uh, we have uh, fixed wing, uh, long endurance uh, fixed wing, which can actually fly, for example, up to eight hours. We also have a uh, smaller fixed wing, uh, a shorter uh, endurance. Uh, we have helicopter. Uh, drone, uh, we have multi rotor, uh, and we actually, as a group, we produce uh, both commercial grade and also military grade drones. Uh, but however, in Malaysia currently, we only offer our commercial grade drones uh, uh, in Malaysia. So, since uh, we started back in uh, October 2019, uh, we are very much focused in the agriculture sector. So, uh, I would say we are actually uh, still a, a baby in terms of human life because we are less than two years old, uh, relatively a new kid on the block. Uh, but uh, so far we have grown quite, uh, quite a bit. Uh, now we have about uh, 50 headcounts uh, in our company. Uh, more than three quarters are actually pilots. Uh, we have more than uh, 30 pilots now uh, and, uh, and a fleet of, uh, of drones. So coming back to what we actually do in Malaysia currently, we offer our drone commercial services uh, in terms of agriculture spraying, uh, GIS mapping, and also uh, data analytics. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. Can I, uh, can I invite Wilson from Abitech? Sure. Can you hear me? Very well. <clears throat> That's Proceed. great. Yep. So for Avatech, we are an agritech company. So we don't focus just on drones, but at the same time, combining it with smart sensors with, for agriculture purposes. So we have been operating for the past three years in agriculture. So the mentioned um, drones are of course the standard, your fixed wing, your multi rotor spring drones and so on. But beyond that, there's some of the things that are not commonly um, or rather not sufficient to be captured by drones includes the smart sensors, your soil moisture, your um, MPK, your water level, and so on. So as, as good as drones can be, it's not able to capture what is not seen. So if it's under the canopy, most likely not able to capture much information on that. And that's where we, we have, um, uh, I would say, the solution for Agriculture 4.0, where we bring in both drones and smart sensor solutions to make plantation smarter and more efficient. So there's a lot about remote control. It's a lot about control systems. It's a lot about reducing the reliance on manpower, which you mentioned, 500,000. Um, we operate predominantly in Indonesia, and that's where most of the workforce is coming from. They're going into Malaysia. Even within Indonesia itself, um, there is a significant shortage of manpower, and that is driven partly by COVID. The other one, major one, is just a general in improvement, improvement in the quality of life. The younger generations find that if they go into agriculture, they wouldn't have much prospect in their whole life. So that is something that we hope to change. And it will change, I'm sure. That, that perspective, when technology comes in, it will change. And that is something that we hope to bring forward as well. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wilson. So on to JX yeah, from Polar Drone. A brief introduction about your company and what you do in the markets that you, that you are in. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Safwan. And great to be here with everyone today. Good morning or afternoon. And again, congrats to uh, Iskandar IRB team to ready to pull this off. It's a shame that um, because of COVID, we can't do this physically in Iskandar right now. I think it would be great yeah. to meet everyone. Uh, it's been too long agree. and really see all the facilities at the ground that uh, we have in Iskandar. So a bit about us, we started Polar Drone back in 2017. Um, it's about five years already right now, where um, in the grand scheme of things as a company, we still consider ourselves as a baby as well. Um, it's just five years. Right now, we, what we do as a company, there are a few segments. Um, 
but in relation to the agriculture segment is we provide our we build our own solutions on the GIS mapping front. We have a software called Aramap where the function is really to help plantations and we work mainly with oil palm plantations to streamline their whole analytics workflow. As well as more recently, we launched a point-to-point -point agriculture sprayer for immature oil palm, where if you think about the oil palm segment, it's a 25-year-old crop. And for the first three years of after replanting, there's a requirement for them to do point-to-point -point spraying for pesticide every fortnight. So if you multiply that out over three years, that's 78 times of repetitive spraying that you have to do. And that's where our solution comes in to solve that. So for that, um, and partially due to COVID as well, we've seen a huge demand and an increase in the agriculture drone segment in Malaysia where there is really too much demand that we can handle. Um, and a lot of plantations are looking into it as well where first automation for agriculture, it makes sense, especially from a pesticide spraying perspective. Of course, number one, you don't need to rely on foreign labor, but more importantly, right, it's more efficient and also it complies and helps the sustainability efforts where instead of human labor being in prolonged contact with pesticides and so on, um, you are now operating safely at the distance, which of course is in line with improving worker quality, health, jobs, and so on as well. So for our team, we are operating right now in Malaysia and Thailand. Uh, of course, Malaysia is our HQ where we have not a super big team, about 60, 70 people. And as a drone solutions provider, um, more than three quarters of our workforce is actually in R&D, uh, engineering, AI, big data, and so on, that we focus on the tech. In terms of operations, we work with a lot of service providers and we build the drones for them and they would then go out and service customers. So uh, in terms of numbers wise, since the start of the company, we've sold at least a few hundred units of drones into the market already. And of course, the battery industry in Malaysia, it's a lot more advanced in terms of spraying work, but the oil palm industry recently has also caught up quite a lot. And it's probably going to overtake, I would say, the battery industry in terms of drone adoption very soon. Thanks, Jax. So um, I think you, uh, for the audience out there, you can see how humble our speakers are. Despite having 50, 60 people, you know, four to five years in the market, they're still they're calling themselves baby. But I think if you look at the overall, how the, the industry has uh, um, evolved, yeah? Um, I mean, the, the commercial drone sector side is still, you know, largely, I would say, still in the early, early phase, yeah? But the, 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 the opportunity is that the, advance of, the advancement of technology has actually really, really leapfrogged that. If you look at the, 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 the drone where, where, uh, and, or your or, um, uh, unmanned aerial uh, uh, UAS yeah? system or, or vehicle, um, we see the, the introduction in the military industry or sector a lot, lot uh, earlier. Yeah? But I think that now commercial has um, um, taken the technology and really adopting it and applying it you know, and, and really sprinting right now um, uh, full speed in agriculture. So what I would like to do next, yeah, uh, and also for the for the knowledge of the audience, is now you've heard uh, I've sort of like painted a context, yeah, and then you had the uh, um, the speakers themselves introduce what areas they are in. So I'm going to ask like three uh, questions, only three questions, but inside there are sub questions, and um, and these are all to the, all the drone panelists here, yeah. And uh, we can take turns in terms of answering, but I think we will you will see that there will be uh, subtle of, of, of differences in terms based on the industry they're in, sectors they're in. So I hope that can be of benefit to the audience listening in. So when we talk about, okay, the first question I want to ask Wilson, when we talk about opportunities, yeah. So today is, you know, there, there's been various other sessions on drones and agriculture, yeah, drone ecosystem, yeah. So when we talk about opportunities in drone tech and agriculture sector, yeah, because you operate outside of Malaysia, you're in Indonesia. So I just want to have your comment, Wilson, in terms of what are the opportunities that you see in the Malaysia agriculture sector that you feel can be unlocked or unlocked further through the use of drones? Yeah, and that is question one. Perhaps you can relate that to you know economic growth, jobs. What are you seeing right, right there? Sure, sure. Thanks. So I think there is two main big opportunities for drone tech. Number one, of course, is upskilling of workers. People who were previously, in a way, considered blue-collar workers are getting opportunities. Like Mata Tech has 50 people. Ourselves in Indonesia, we are running around 250 uh, drone pilots. 
So it's a huge opportunity for people who are previously, they might not have the qualifications for a high value job and they are getting much better um, growth prospect with this. So with drones, it's up giving them a big opportunity to grow. And from there on, they are able to progress in terms of management skills, in terms of technical skills, and then have a much better career path as compared to be how, how they were before. Especially if they were from the local communities, they might not have the education, they might not have the opportunities to go beyond that before this. So that is a huge part of it. Um, but the second one also is not just employment, but allowing the farmers to be a more prestigious job. So in Bill Gates in US, he's the largest farm owner in the whole of US. It's not something that is um, shameful. It's not something that should be considered blue collar work, worker. But the problem in Southeast Asia is they're all small holders and it's not consolidated. So there is no scale in the way that they operate, which results in the fact that they are all not making good money. The quality of life is low. Now, technology will come in and that should go through a period of consolidation where the old, old guards will either give up their farm, they'll sell it away, or the younger generations will start to buy up and then it will come in together. And then we should see a much better consolidation of the industry, which would be able to drive mechanization and technology. So one of the problems that is hindering this growth is scale. If the farmers doesn't have scale, if you only have one hectares of um, paddy or one hectares of palm or durian, you can't invest because the money that you make from it is just not significant. But if you're able to consolidate number a, a significant hectare um, that you have, that changes the equation. Now, mechanization becomes very important. You can really reap big rewards. And we're talking about not just a few hundred dollars, but millions of dollars they can make for themselves. And that should change the um, image of being a farmer or being in the agriculture industry. So that would be the two um, biggest prospects, I think, for Malaysia, where the farmers themselves are getting a better quality of life. And it also creates new jobs for the younger generation to come. I mean, not everyone has land, right? So unfortunately, it still requires that um, fortunate um, individuals who have inheritance or they have capital to begin with. So yeah. unfortunately, that's how life is going to be. Thanks, Wilson, for your view. Uh, DX? Yeah, I think I definitely agree that uh, the consolidation needs to happen where uh, that's why we have a lot of cooperatives and everything within Malaysia as well, especially in the paddy industry. Um, where it doesn't make sense for a smallholder farmer that owns what, two hectares to buy a drone that's what, 30, 40K. Uh, it's, it's crazy for them to invest that kind of money. But what works is actually forming cooperatives where I say if 100 farmers come together and then they invest in, together for a drone and they share it among themselves. And that, that really works, of course. Um, so definitely agree with Yusun on this. Okay. Okay, let's, let's stick on that because I want to go to uh, Wan Azrin because talking about Padi and, and uh, I think from day one since I met uh, Wan Azrin from Mata Aerotech, it's always been about Padi, rice, you know. So your input as well in terms of, you know, this is what we are seeing. The, 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 the smallholders, Padi, uh, uh, Sawah Padi not being utilized, you know, uh, production going down. So what are the opportunities that you can unlock using drones yeah, uh, uh, in, that, in that sector that you're focusing? Uh, uh, correct. I, I agree to what uh, Wilson and also JX has already uh, mentioned. Uh, the biggest challenge that we face in Malaysia in terms of uh, accelerating the adoption of drone technology, especially in the paddy sector, is because of the small scale. Uh, I think based on the Kazana report, the average uh, ownership uh, of paddy uh, is about two to four hectares uh, per farmer, very small scale. So that is why when we first enter uh, the agriculture sector with our drone technology, ours be, our business model has always been as a service provider because we cannot expect farmers with a small holding uh, can afford to buy drone, which at that time could cost up to 50, 60,000 ringgit. Of course, now the drone prices have come down uh, somewhat. Uh, so that is one of the challenges that we face. Uh, the other uh, challenge that we face is in terms of the 
uh, education uh, of farmers itself. I give you a very good example. Uh, currently, farmers, uh, when they do their uh, chemical spraying, uh, pesticide or herbicide, they use a manual backpack, right? So they typically use about 200 liters of water plus chemical to spray one hectare of paddy, right? 200 liters. So when we use drone to do uh, chemical spraying for some same size of one hectare, we only need up to 20 liters. So we are only using 10% now, 10% now. So imagine telling the farmers, now you don't need 200 liters, you only need 20 liters. They can, they can tell you, go fly a kite. You know, you are telling me now, I only need 20 liters. So this is something that we faced very early on uh, when we wanted to introduce uh, drone technology to farmers, right? In terms of educating them, why we only need 20 liters? It is about the... Uh, spraying uniformity uh, provided by drone technology. Uh, I want to touch a little bit on the uh, opportunity as what we also mentioned just now, uh, not only in terms of uh, providing uh, high value jobs to, 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 to farmers and also to youth, uh, right? But also at the end of the day, as a commercial entity, as a business, we will have to look at the dollar and cents, right? Whether it actually makes sense for, for us to actually offer our drone technology uh, in the agriculture sector, uh, including paddy. Uh, I give you an example. Uh, if we look at uh, Mada, right? Mada is the rice bowl of Malaysia uh, with a size of about, uh, I think about 100,000 hectares uh, in total, right? 100,000 hectares. So in a typical paddy season, right? Uh, farmers spray about five rounds of chemicals, pesticide and also herbicide, five rounds, right? So if we take an average of uh, spraying fee of about 45 ringgit per hectare, per round, right? That will come out to 20 over million, right? Per season. In one year in Malaysia, we have two paddy seasons. So that is already 50, almost 50 million ringgit just of spraying chemicals alone in paddy, right? In Mada. So if you talk about Malaysia as the market, you multiply that by five or six, right? So we have a, a, a market value of what, like three to 500 million just spraying chemicals for paddy. So in terms of opportunities, there are a lot of opportunities uh, in terms of uh, drone technology in Malaysia. As uh, rightly what uh, GX mentioned just now, all palm. We are also moving into all palm. All palm in Malaysia, five million hectares. So can you imagine uh, the, the market value there untapped yet? So uh, I, I would say uh, in terms of uh, opportunities for drone technology, huge uh, in Malaysia, like uh, what GX mentioned just now. Uh, demand has uh, gone up quite a bit, uh, primarily also because of COVID, because of uh, uh, the shortage of labor. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, I would say uh, demand now Far exceed supply. You know how fast we can actually uh, train our pilots and how fast we can actually produce drones. So that that is a I would say a good challenge for us to have now. Thank, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think we we probably seen a, a sudden drop in terms of number of attendees here yeah, to your session because when you mentioned three hundred million, you know, uh, and suddenly people start rushing out and say, "I'm I'm going to go and, and train myself." <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but I'm telling the audience, you know, hang on to your seats here yeah, because now this gets better. Now this is where the, the, the discussion gets juicier because you know now everybody wants to rush, rush out there. So hearing you know, I've got uh, opportunity smallholder opportunities precision spraying, you know that much of untapped opportunities out there in when you talk about drones and paddy. Now let's talk about uh, the challenges. Yeah. So I'm gonna um, and I'm I'm gonna ask you know so so we have heard about the opportunity so how to accelerate this adoption you 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 spoke about demand right now you don't you don't have enough uh, capacity to be able to 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 meet yeah the 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 demand so how do we accelerate the adoption yeah and number one and number two of course this is something which is also close to your heart. What are the challenges that you're facing you know, in order to, to, to meet that demand? Okay, so for that, I'm gonna, uh, GX, I want you to kick yep. off this portion first. 
Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Definitely, I agree that it's uh, the market is huge, but it's not easy. I think nothing in agriculture, when you talk about analytics and automation, is easy. Um, and there's really a few reasons for it. Uh, of course, the market, like it's mentioned, especially the oil palm market is huge. You talk about Malaysia, 5 million hectares. Um, how do we even cover that? And the thing you must remember is when you're dealing with these oil palm players, most of them are huge corporates. And the kind of process and everything they have is quite intensive. And that's the first challenge. Like, are you even equipped to handle with these kind of, these kind of companies? Which is very different from dealing with smallholders uh, on the ground where you go out to the paddy fields, you talk to them, you discuss, you convince them. Whereas the big players like your Sim Derby, Gunting and so on, they have a very systematic process on how they bring technology into their workforce. And that's what we've been doing over the last, um, I think half a year, where most of these large players, before you even take a foot step into their estate commercially, they will ask you to go through this entire commercial uh, POC process, which typically takes three to four months and you have to come up with the money for it. Um, they're not gonna pay for it, just to be frank. Um, so that's where the challenge is really, you have to invest this kind of cap capital to do that. But of course, really how to solve it, it's really, um, and how we see in the industry, it's a lot of, there's a lot of collaboration going on right now, where for us as a solution provider, we are taking the first step to go into these players and invest that kind of first upfront cost to prove that the technology works for them. Um, like was mentioned just now, instead of spraying 100 liters per hectare, you're reducing it to what, 20 liters and it's the same thing with oil palm as well that no one has done yet. How do we even know what's the exact amount of pesticide we need to spray per palm? Last time they used to do 500 ml per palm. Can we do it with 150? Can we do it with 50? Um, and this kind of numbers is extremely important for us because it affects the entire unit economics of spraying completely. Um, so that's what we are taking up as a solution provider, building up this case study and so on so that other service providers, and we are very open to sharing this kind of information and other service provider can then learn from it. And of course, adopt the kind of SOP and the standards that the large estates have established and works for them. So that's one of the thing really relying a lot of this collaboration work between the ecosystem. Uh, of course, second one of us, and I think Safwan, you would want, love to hear about it on the NTIS front. Um, that has definitely helped with a lot of these challenges as well, where uh, NTIS team has been great to connect us with some of the key stakeholders within both the regulation side, but also the commercial side as well in FELDA, FGE and so on. And that's where uh, we need more of these kind of programs and more companies being involved in these kind of programs as well. Because a lot of the tech ecosystem for agriculture, uh, we can't do it alone. We have to work together um, to form, like Wilson has his ground-based IoT sensors and everything. And definitely we have customers that are looking for that as well. And it doesn't make sense for us to invest in that R&D to build it because the, like I mentioned earlier, the POC and the cost of market entry for a new solution is extremely high and it takes a lot of time. All right, got it, got it. So let me see, since you mentioned Wilson, so Wilson, let's have your view on it as well. Yeah, I think similar experience, our POC we're talking about, a sales cycle will easily be six months to one year. Yeah. Is this both, uh -huh. uh, sorry, may I just interject? This is uh, a, a, the both uh, Malaysia, Indonesia? Both Malaysia and Indonesia so far, I think we, we experience the same um, mindset. Um, of course, the smallholders are much faster, but if it's a corporation, usually what happens is they will have an R&D division, internal R&D division, which everything has to be vetted and approved by them. So uh, we're looking at multiple political interests within the company itself, um, vested interests from different parties, which is the reason why this kind of POC, you're not talking about one time, you're talking about yeah. two, three, four, five, sometimes 10 times of um, free POCs. And it's extremely bad now because of COVID. So every time you do a POC, you need to do your swap test, you need to travel, you need to get all kinds of regulation that, um, which is rightfully there for a good reason but um, it's made challenging, of course, during this pandemic as well. So um, dealing with these big corporations, huge upside, um, but also a huge time and investment to make it happen. So that's a big portion of it. Um, coming to one of the questions, I think um, working with universities and academics is one of the big ones that we have been looking at. Unfortunately, right now, we don't see much uh, interest or uptake in universities and academics so far, um, at least from our point of view. 
we have been trying. So that is something that um, we are looking at because just now I think Asran um, mentioned the traditional methods of doing things, 200 liters per hectare, doesn't really work very well for drones. And those protocols have been set in stone because of the technology that was available back then. Now with new things that changes, um, all these protocols should change, but has not been uh, widely accepted. So that is something that um, we see could be moving forward in terms of not just regulation, but market understanding from academic studies so that it's more widespread and more acceptable for all the farmers to take on this, not just the technology itself, but the end results. Okay, thank you. I mean, for the academics listening in, you know, I think that's a good tip by Wilson in the sense that we need to make sure that uh, we, we shift, you know, in terms of improve the market understanding, improve in terms of, of I think, even adoption as well. I think the universities, the academia are involved, yeah, but perhaps we can do with a lot more, a better collaboration between the industry uh, players as well as the academia, yeah. And I think the, the uh, Iskandar folks listening in, um, and you have your EduCT team, yeah. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity for you to follow up. Uh, on, on the last note, on uh, from um, from uh, one Azrain as well, yeah. When it comes to challenges, you perhaps see a unique set of challenges in your own sector. So, what are those, and how do you do you think that we can best improve? Uh, uh, based on our experience, we do face uh, uh, similar challenges, as mentioned by JX and also uh, Wilson. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the the amount of time that we need to actually roll out uh, certain projects. Uh, for example, uh, JX uh, would know this, we were also engaged by one of the uh, big uh, oil pump companies. You know, it took us almost six months to actually roll it out. Uh, you know, they were very thorough uh, because, you know, big companies, they have their processes and systems. Uh, they do things like uh, drone calibration, you know, they do spraying calibration. Uh, you know, you have to do spraying tests and whatnot. They put, can you imagine, they put water sensitive papers uh, uh, on the oil palm. And then when we do the spraying, they will look at the water sensitive papers to see whether there are how many droplets, uh, you know, uh, on the water sensitive papers. They go to that uh, extent. So that is why uh, it takes a very long time uh, sometimes to actually roll out certain projects. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, uh, it goes back to education, uh, as what uh, Wilson uh, rightly mentioned. Uh, uh, for example, we do spraying in uh, several places. You know, when we go to a certain place, uh, farmers sometimes ask us, oh, can you increase the volume uh, from 20 to 30? Uh, you know, uh, but we ask the question, why? You know, nobody can actually uh, say uh, precisely why is required 30. It's all based on time and error. So we need somebody, you know, whether the universities or even the Department of Agriculture to actually do a proper study and actually provide the guideline to all farmers. You don't need 30, you don't need 40. Yeah, 30, grandfather say 30, that's why 30 lah. Correct, exactly. <laughs> yes, so uh, that is one of the, uh, the, the bigger challenge that we face uh, currently in terms of uh, providing guidelines to farmers. You know, even in terms of uh, spraying parameters, uh, I think more often than not, it is mainly, I would say, it's try and error. How fast do you fly the drone? How high? You know, there's no specific guideline provided by anybody. Right? Uh, I think apart from that, we must also include uh, the stakeholders uh, in the agriculture sector, especially uh, the, the producers of the chemicals, because they know uh, you know, how much uh, volume is needed per hectare and so on, you know, uh, using uh, the drone. Uh, I think uh, on your question, uh, Safwan, on how we can actually accelerate the adoption of drone technology, especially in the agriculture sector, I think for now, uh, it is basically, or I would say mainly, uh, based on organic growth, you know, supply and demand kind of thing. Uh, very slow, very slow. Uh, so if we want to accelerate this, I think, uh, the government may need to play uh, a bigger role, maybe providing in terms of, uh, I don't know, if you want to call it carrot and uh, stick uh, kind of thing. You know, uh, for example, uh, if we take a paddy, for example, right, the government provides uh, a lot of incentives to farmers every year. 
billions, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, agriculture input uh, subsidies. Actually, one point one one point eight billion in 2018. Uh, exactly, you know, a lot of money. So the government may not have uh, more money to spend to provide incentives, you know, uh, subsidizing drone uh, uh, service and so on. But what the government can do, for example, is if you don't use a drone, you won't get the subsidy. You know, provide that kind of uh, regulation so that more and more farmers adopt drone technology. Because at the end of the day, by adopting drone technology, it can provide a lot of benefits to the farmers. You know, uh, hopefully at the end of the day, what everybody um, uh, you know, uh, like to talk about is uh, uh, dollar and cents, how much the farmers can earn at the end of the day, right? True. So uh, I agree, there must be some form of uh, uh, intervention from the government to actually uh, accelerate or expedite the adoption of drone technology in the agriculture sector. Point taken. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just that this group is a bit different because um, chances are, if we talk about challenges, the number one topic that we're going to discuss is regulation. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I think for, for now, I think we'll, we'll not touch that topic because we not we need another one hour on the topic of regulation its own. But I think it's just just to give it a, a different uh, perspective. Yeah. It's not it's not just regulation. I think mm -hmm. the point that that JX, you know, Wana Zain and Wilson is saying here is that. Regulation is an important component, but it is not the whole thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. education, uh, awareness, yeah, the involvement of other parties. Yeah, all these are important. Thank you, JX, as well for mentioning the the sandbox. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, nice of you. Uh, and I am going to pause for a while because you know I'm just looking at time. When we have some questions that have come in, and we might miss uh, the questions if we don't address them now. So. The first question I see is, Assalamu alaikum and salam jazatuan, how the government corporate work in support of the drone industry in agrotech? Okay, I think because the question is relating uh, 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 to, to the government, I I, uh, I will volunteer to take this question. And uh, um, I think the name is Dean, Dean from RPU. I just wanted to highlight that um, there are various ways. The one which I'm more, uh, the one I'm in charge and looking after, it would be the National Technology and Innovation Sandbox or Sandbox, whereby we actually link government as well as corporates. Yeah, in the case of what uh, JX has mentioned, uh, working with Velda and uh, working with uh, local innovative technology and product uh, entrepreneurs. Yeah, and we are trying to implement that in the agri sector. Yeah, so have a look at sandbox.gov.my. So that's one question. Okay, I'm going to look at the second question. There are a lot of drones agriculture being bought and used, bought directly and assembled locally in Malaysia at this point in time. However, understandably due to safety and risk, regulation very strict as per later CAD. Okay, there you go. You can't run away from regulation. So how do you see this trend affecting local ecosystem? I suppose this, you know, uh, um, um, I, want, I want to go for it to JX first, yeah? Um, how do you see this this trend? Yeah, yep. about uh, international drones bought assembled here. Yep, definitely the local assembled DIY drone market is a huge market, and I, I would estimate that it's actually bigger than the other uh, branded drones from DJI, from XAG, and so on. Uh, because as us as a company, one of our main business is actually on the distribution side, where we distribute DJI products, but also we do distribute a lot of agriculture spare parts. Um, to a lot of main suppliers up in Jitra, Kedah, Kelantan area. Uh, and over the last two years, we've seen the volume from those guys has just shot up way over. Um, where in the last, I think 12 months alone, our biggest one, they bought at least over 150, 200 units of grown parts to assemble themselves. So the volume is definitely there. And a lot of them has also asked us, like, what's our take on the civil aviation directive? Like, how does that affect them? Because a lot of these locally assembled drones, right? They don't have, um, obviously they don't have stream, they don't have proper safety certification, no QC, QA, and so on. So that would definitely be affected. But the good thing is um, at least with the partners that we are dealing with, everyone is aware of the reason why civil aviation wants to bring this kind of uh, directives in. It's for their own safety and the sustainability of the industry. So they do understand that. Um, and the question now is really, and they have as well, it's how do we roll out this kind of certification program that makes it easy for them to comply to. I think that's the question that we have. Um, it's not a matter of 
whether they everyone wants to do it or not. I think everyone has the best interest. They want to do it because it's a livelihood at hand. But mm -hmm. the question is more on can we do it and make it easily accessible to everyone? So that's where we have to talk. And we have been talking to um, really proposing certain things to do. Um, and even say, because as a distributor, we are bringing in a lot of items. We could act as the party that helps with all the certification uh, process, getting the components certified by stream, by civil aviation, and so on. So that's one of the aspects that we're looking at from. Okay, th thanks, JX. I just wanted to, to highlight that we are working very closely as well with CIRIM, yeah, and with various regulators when it comes to uh, uh, areas of agriculture and the National Technology and Innovation Sandbox, yeah. So I want to go to uh, Wan Azrin because, you know, you work very closely with Taiwan uh, when it comes to the drones, your drones as well. So how, how do you see this affecting, this trend affecting you? Uh, well, at the end of the day, uh, I think uh, when we talk about drone technology, right, uh, first and foremost, uh, at the top of the list of everybody, you know, must be safety. You know, as long as uh, everyone can actually uh, ensure the safety, uh, the airworthiness uh, of the drone itself, I think uh, we, we must welcome this. You know, it is good for us uh, as a country to actually develop our own uh, ecosystem. Uh, so uh, at the end of the day, when we talk about drone technology, we must always uh, look at two parts. One is the drone itself, you know, uh, whether drone is uh, airworthy. Uh, uh, second is in terms of the drone pilots, whether they have the competency uh, to actually fly the drone safely. So as long as everybody uh, can uh, fall within this uh, regulation, regulatory framework, I think by all means, please. But at the same time, uh, I hope the government would not be too restrictive uh, in terms of the, 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 the regulatory framework that it would hinder the development and also the growth uh, uh, of the technology, right? But at the end of the day, as, as what we have seen so far, right? Uh, technology moves very fast. Uh, like everybody, like uh, Wilson, JX, and ourselves, right? For the past uh, two more years, right? We have been uh, uh, in the industry uh, without uh, proper regulation, actually. Uh, you know? Uh, so we welcome some form of regulation, um, uh, especially, uh, I would say, uh, for the drone pilots, for example, right? So that their, their career are actually secured. Uh, because currently any, uh, mind my language, any Tom, Dick and Harry can just go buy a drone and then fly and offer the services. Right. Uh, you know, uh, without uh, proper uh, concern about Lesson, safety. Lesson, knowledge, so certification, training, yes, yeah, exactly. regards to exactly. public safety. So I think, right. Wilson, is, is that what you're observing in, you know, because I'm going to vary a bit. Continuing the question, but just looking at uh, the different markets, yeah, uh, bringing your experience in Indonesia as well. So we, we just, just talked about the, the CAD, Civil Aviation Directive, which is reg, part of regulation. So what is your observation? Malaysia, yeah, Indonesia, think... and ASEAN. Because we're talking about our topic is, is, is about using Malaysia, using maybe DRZ as a launch pad you know, to go to regional. Yeah. I can speak mostly for Singapore and Indonesia side. Um, Singapore do have established, we don't have agriculture, but drones has been a big part of the um, directive and they have been trying to push for the adoption of it. Um, it's getting cleaner, I think, in terms of how you can get yourself certified, but it does bring a lot of hurdles to get for someone who's um, trying to get started. Now, not only you need to go through a course, you need to be uh, certified by certain um, accredited companies so which means you need to pay twice just for the accreditation subsequently with um, activity permit as we call it here um, then only you can operate which is a huge pain honestly you go to Indonesia they are implementing similar things um, it's all adopted from US and Europe similar kind of uh, framework that they are taking on but enforcement is a big question mark so, yeah, even in, in, in agriculture, who goes there, right? If you're not working there, nobody goes in there. And which is also something that I think the aviation authorities should relook really at. Um, not all drones are made the same and not all risks are the same because when you operate in an urban environment versus in an agriculture environment, the worst probably the pilot and the trees will get damaged. That's, that, that's a... Um, 
catastrophe that it can create as compared to someone in oil and gas, in urban environment, different story altogether. So I don't think there is a good segmentation of regulation as of now. So that is something that we hope to see and we are trying to push for. But I don't think he has been successful so far, put it this way. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank, thank you for your, for your honesty. I think, that, you know, just doing a time check, you know, we, we are nearing the end of our session. Uh, I do have a third question, uh, uh, more like a, a, a request or, or a wish list to be more precise. Yeah, uh, we spoke about opportunities. We spoke about challenges. Uh, now I'm just looking, the, you know, channeling the spotlight back to you. If you're given like um, um, you know GX and Wilson and Wana uh a, a form, is this is called like a wish list? Yeah. So in, in one minute, I just want to know in terms of what would that wish list be? Yeah. Uh, and also direct it to whom so that we can then act upon it. Yeah. For example, dear Mr. Regulator, da 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 da. Yeah. Da, 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 is, uh, this is what I would like. Yeah. So yeah, about um, I'm yeah. giving you about 30 seconds each, you know, so yeah. make it snappy. So what is your wish list? Starting. Uh, can with, I have two? Ah, uh, okay, la, for today's special. GRZ okay. will grant you the other one. Okay, what is Rain? I'll start with you. Uh, okay, uh, wish list. Uh, I think uh, if you look at the government's role, right, uh, we can actually look at uh, several roles the government can play. Uh, one is in terms of facilitator, uh, in terms of funding, in terms of uh, business matching, and so on. Uh, so we need that. We need more of that, you know, so that we can actually build a very uh, good uh, ecosystem here in Malaysia. Uh, second, uh, of course, the government is a, a regulator, right? So we need a good, uh, uh, I would say, a, a framework uh, for the industry to grow uh, and prosper. Uh, and also the government can actually become a shareholder in the industry. You know, uh, to a certain extent, the government, uh, because drone technology to a certain extent is quite relatively new in Malaysia. So we still need government to play an active role to spur the growth uh, and also the introduction uh, uh, of the technology. And last but not least, wow, the there's government- There's three, three already. Right? <laughs> there's, there's three already. Yeah, but this is only one point. Uh, oh. I'm just talking about the government's role. <laughs> okay, last okay, but okay. not least, the government is actually a user. Yep. Right? More often than not, uh, based on experience, right? if we look back uh, in terms of the introduction of new technology, the gov government is actually the first mover the first adopter of technology, all right? Point. So we, we, we may need the government to play that role, uh, you know, for us to actually accelerate uh, the adoption of drone technology uh, in Malaysia, especially. Right? Got it. Thank you so much. Wilson, your wish. Yeah, uh, I think one of the things that we could look at was um, how China has encouraged the adoption of drones. So number one is a big one is they subsidize the farmers from mechanizing yeah. and then making it easy for the farmers to pick on. So it's a lot about identification of the person, knowing who is operating, how, the, how they're operating and making sure they're certified. So if we just need to, these two factors to come in closely and they have successfully rolled it out in, in such a big country. So just model after them, it should work in most countries, I believe. Okay. Wow, that's brief. Thank yeah. you so much. You know, I actually wanted to ask earlier in terms of if you have a model country that to look at. So in a way, in your wish list, you have addressed that. Thanks, Wilson. Okay, DX. So I think Wilson and Wan Shren spoke about my two wish lists already. So I have nothing else. Ah. A apart from, I think one, one key thing, if I have a wish list is really, um, I, I think Civil Aviation Malaysia, they are doing a great job um, to the best of their capability but they do need more resources and more funding, I think. If you look at the comparison, the, even the team size of our drone task force in Malaysia compared to Singapore, we have, what, 30 million population, land area is so much bigger than in Singapore. I think Singapore drone task force is, if I'm not wrong, last count was 80, 90 people. Malaysia is less than 10. So, like, um, where, how are we? It's unreasonable, I think, to have such high expectations on civil aviation with the kind of resources that they are limited with. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really a chicken and egg problem because as one, once we get the regulations up and running, there will be certification and revenue streams for civil aviation. They are a privatized 
uh, agency anyway. So we have to make sure that it's sustainable. Uh, but how do we get to that point that there is a good framework in place for industry players to really contribute back as well for the sustainability of the industry? So that's where I think the government needs to come in, take the first step, uh, at least build up the framework, invest a bit, put in the resources required. After that, then you can rely on the industry players to really uh, continue the sus sustainability of the agency and for, I mean, all the certification and safety. So at all least right. take the first step. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think it's that, you know, a, a, a nice touch on, uh, you know, uh, uh, bringing in a civil aviation team and the drone task force. Certainly they have a lot uh, that they have to yeah. do and they are working really, really hard. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Captain Akila, Fadil, Captain Norazban, Captain Chester, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we know these people by heart and then you engage them too. Yeah. So I, I think that's a case, you know, for CM to grow bigger, yeah, uh, to, to better support the ecosystem. Thanks, JX. You know, it's, it's, it's so, there's so much more that I, I would like to post uh, the, um, to, to the three panelists. You know, there are questions also that is remain unanswered, but alas, you know, we've got two minutes left and uh, that's all that we have time for. You know, I hope that we can uh, continue to engage one another. We have a healthy ecosystem. Uh, we can use DRZ as a platform to do so. Yeah, we have the organizer to continue uh, to engage the communities here. Also to facilitate some of the unanswered questions, perhaps to be posted to the relevant panelists uh, so that they may get the answers they are looking for. For those of you um, who are listening in, you have seen that the, these huge opportunities there when we talk about drone tax and agriculture, but it is not without its sets of challenges which are now being addressed and it needs uh, help from private sector, public sector, academia. Yeah? So, if you are interested in uh, in the, the in drone tax and, and agriculture, I would like you to invite you again. Engage the DRZ team. Also engage uh, our National Technology and Innovation Sandbox at sandbox.gov.my because you know we have agriculture as one of the ten critical uh, uh, socio-economic uh, driver yeah, that we are actually pushing for the entire nation. So. I think that is all that we have time for to, uh, today. Yeah, thank you so much to the audience for listening in. I have to thank again uh, the team at uh, Kazana, Skanda Investment Berhad, you know, DRZ Ignite uh, the organizing team. Yeah, and also to our esteemed panelists for for their for their valuable valuable as well as honor sharing. Yeah. Uh, Wilson from Avitech, Wan Azrain Adnan from Matara Tech, and Jizi Chiong from Polar Drone. With that, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, we'll, until we see you again. Thank, thank you all. You.